Consulting in Berlin, Germany, and um, I'm your moderator for today's call. So uh, thanks for, for joining, and welcome to the, the first uh, global consortium webinar in this year, in 2011. Um, just for those of you who are not totally familiar with the Global Consortium for Employee Health, it's really designed as a global thought leadership forum, and basically to assist organizations that are looking to improve the health and to enhance performance of their employees worldwide for competitive advantage. Um, so today, our webinar has a, a, a truly global theme. Um, first, as uh, always, I waited in anticipation the findings of the global survey on health promotion and workplace wellness strategies. Um, that's our first agenda item to be presented by Barry Hall from Buck Consultants. Uh, and as usual, lots of interesting results and insights from the, from the fourth annual survey. After that, um, another uh, special treat uh, awaits us as we will hear from, uh, well, basically one of the largest employers in the world with approximately 420,000 employees, which is Siemens. Uh, we're joining us from Munich, Germany, specifically Dr. Ralf Franke, the corporate medical director, to discuss, uh, introduce their global health management system. Before we start with the speakers, I just wanted to make you aware of one really important global initiative in our field. Um, the World Health Organization is currently um, responding to the need for uh, practical global, regional, and country guidance on integrated and comprehensive um, workplace health um, strategies and programs. And uh, they have published, in the, not fairly recently, uh, a, glow, a framework and, uh, and a model for healthy workplaces. And it's, it's very comprehensive. It includes four main areas. It's the physical work environment, the psychosocial work environment, you know, personal health resources, and then also the enterprise community involvement. And all of that is, is com comes together in, in terms of a continual improvement process, which is at the core of the, of the model. Um, so I, I really think that this has not been uh, pushed or broadcast globally, uh, this type of comprehensive model, which, which I truly believe is, is very important and uh, needed uh, in, in our field. Um, so the framework already exists, and currently a global guidance document is being, uh, being drafted for uh, basically targeted to employers and employees. So what I wanted to say is your input is welcome. Um, we're actually going to be introducing uh, the document uh, in our next webinar in May, but now is really a good time to, to have the opportunity to influence uh, the look and feel of the document, the contents. And so please, you know, contact me if, you, if you're interested as, as I'm actually working on it. Um, you can also find it, uh, or not the document yet, but the, the framework and the model, you can find it online um, if you search for World Health Organization and Healthy Workplaces. So uh, I, I encourage you to do that. Okay, so uh, now to our uh, uh, featured speakers. I'd like to uh, mention that uh, to hold your questions um, to after the presenters have spoken. Of course, if you have any pressing clarification questions, uh, please type them in, and we'll, we'll pick them up uh, uh, as we see uh, the need for it to do that. Um, so our first speaker is Barry Hall. Barry is, the, uh, or is a principal in the clinical health consulting practice of Buck Consultants and leads the global wellness research. And Barry, I'll leave it at that and just uh, take it away, please. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Wolf. And uh, thank you all for um, attending this, uh, this morning. Looks like we've got a, a large group and a growing group. Um, so I will uh, try and keep the number up there <laughs> rather than have folks dropping off. Um, so I'm, um, uh, Wolf asked me to talk for just about 15 minutes here and give you a high level of some of the trends and uh, findings that we have from our latest survey. Now, I know that um, many of your organizations have uh, participated in this survey uh, this year and in past years, so thank you very much for that. Um, it's, uh, uh, we are now in our fourth year of doing this Global Health Promotion Survey. Um, it is uh, run by my organization, Buck Consultants, uh, with a lot of assistance from uh, Cigna, especially V-Life, um, also Wolf, Kirsten, um, and Pfizer and World at Work are other uh, primary sponsors. Um, and what we are seeking to do is take the pulse of um, workplace health promotion
abortion programs around the world. And we've been uh, getting more and more successful at that with each iteration. This year we had 1,248 employers participating, uh, representing over 13 million employees in 47 different countries. Uh, if you participated, you should have received a full uh, survey report, which is about uh, over 60 pages this year. And um, we also have an executive summary available in 10 different languages. You can download that at bucksurveys.com. And we have a number of uh, special reports on different countries. So we try to, you know, leverage the data in a variety of different ways to help people understand uh, what's happening. So what I would like to share with you are just some high-level, obviously can't go into all the details of the survey, but some of the high-level findings and trends, and hopefully perhaps it will stimulate some conversation as well. Um, first, um, just to give you an indication of the breadth of the survey, this is showing um, for those employers that participated, those 1,200 employers that participated, this is where they have employees. So, for example, 34% of the participating employers had employees in Europe, et cetera. So you can see we've got a pretty good spread um, around the world. If we look at where health promotion programs are offered, so these numbers are, are by continent a ratio of for those employers that have employees in that region, what percentage of them offer some sort of health promotion benefits. Now, health promotion, as I'm sure you know, can um, – have a variety of different, you know, interpretations or components, maybe some occupational health components, EAPs and other things, um, which are perhaps more widespread than some of the more advanced uh, health promotion components. But I think this can give you a general idea, again, within the survey group, that, um, that it's pretty, wide, uh, pretty, pretty evenly spread around the world. Um, we have, you know, a higher number in the U.S. or in North America, driven primarily by the, the uh, current uh, level of interest in the U.S., but certainly uh, continues to be a global phenomenon. Um, I think this is interesting. This is showing how many years the wellness strategy has been in place for the participating employers. You can see the majority of them are just, you know, within a few years uh, old of having a wellness strategy in place. When we look now more specifically and ask a question of the multinational employers. So of those employers that um, – participated, about um, uh, almost half of them are multinational, so they have employees in multiple countries. So for those respondents only, we said, is your health promotion strategy global? Does it cover a majority of your employees regardless of their geography? And more than, a little more than half of them are now saying, yes, they have a global strategy. We've seen a lot of movement in this over the last couple of years. Last year, that 54% was 41%, and two years ago, it was 34%. So I think that, you know, it's an area of um, rapid growth, and I think the interest in, you know, different uh, forums like this one, like the consortium, are, are an indication of the increasing level of interest in how do I globalize my workplace wellness strategy. Um, so we're about, you know, half and half of, uh, at this point of those uh, employers surveyed. So for those who said, no, we don't have a global wellness strategy, um, these are the primary reasons. Um, and, uh, you know, these are probably all look pretty familiar to the folks that are on the call that are, that are dealing with this area. There are certainly a lot of challenges in different cultures and regulations. Um, some organizations don't have kind of a global function that, that health promotion might fit into cleanly. Um, I think what's interesting and perhaps encouraging here is way down at the bottom, not a priority in our organization, very few of those who don't have a health a uh, global strategy cited that as the reason. So the majority of those who don't have a strategy are not saying that it's not a priority. They're just saying that then perhaps there are some other impediments to them uh, putting it in place related to, you know, resources or available vendors or tools, um, et cetera. So I think, I think that's an indication that we're going to continue to see growth uh, in this area. Um, this next chart is always um, – an interesting one to look at each year. Um, this shows um, the prioritization uh, by region of what employers said are the primary drivers, of the reasons that they uh, invest in a wellness and health promotion strategy. And it's always, you know, the U.S. is always a bit of an outlier. The number one reason in the U.S., as you can see, there are health care costs. That's not a primary driver anywhere else in the world. Um, the key driver um, 
and these are this order on this slide is on av the average globally. So the top one, pr productivity and presenteeism, is the top uh, reason on average globally. Um, and, and that's not a surprise. That's uh, you know that's uh, the emerging studies continue to show that there's a pretty significant um, cost benefit um, to wellness and impact on presenteeism. Absence is now number three. It's uh, in the past years it's been number two, right behind presenteeism. Um, but but this year um, improving morale and employee engagement has moved up to the number two slot globally. And you can see if you look across the row, it's a pretty solid number two there. Uh, as well, uh, pretty important in all regions. Um, I suspect that's in part because of the um, recovering from the uh, global recession. Employers are concerned about perhaps about losing employee engagement um, because of you know all the uh, you know unfortunate things they've had to do with perhaps layoffs and, and other things. So uh, this could be reflecting uh, a pain point uh, for employers that they're concerned about engagement and obviously you know. Sponsoring a health promotion program is not going to remedy that in total, but it's one of the tools that they may be using to help um, reinforce to their employees that they're a better place to work. And you can see on down the list safety and, and workability and other um, issues, attracting and retaining employees, et cetera, um, are also up there. And there's some, some variance by region. Um, so that that's shows why employers are investing in health promotion. Uh, the next question is what are the programs that they're investing in, or what are the health issues or health risks that are driving their strategy? Uh, and this one is uh, pretty similar to what we saw last year. Stress is almost universally the top issue globally, except really in the U.S., where it's number six in priority. Last year it was number five. So <laughs> if anything, it's, uh, it's dropped a bit. Um, and, uh, this, you know, this is, uh, I, I think this is really interesting. You can see the, you know, from that point down, there is um, some amount of a alignment in the, you know, physical and nutrition, et cetera, type of issues that are pretty common to most uh, workplace health promotion programs. Um, I think it's also interesting to see, you know, as we're looking at the U.S. as an outlier in the work-life area, again, uh, perhaps the Americas, U.S. and Latin America, have that, you know, at 10 or below, whereas in the rest of the world it's in the top four. Um, and, um, you know, it would be, it'd be interesting. We could probably have an entire session just kind of discussing these particular issues. Um, and I'm not sure that it's saying um, that work-life and stress issues are not important to employers in the Americas, but it may in part be indicating that they – to the extent they're, they're addressing them, they're not really considering a part of their workplace wellness program, uh, which could be uh, could be part of the part of the issue there. Whereas in, in the rest of the world, they're solidly, you know, a, a key focus. We also see um, a lot of interest in psychosocial uh, programs to improve, improve the psychosocial work environment as one of the um, rapidly growing areas in most parts of the world uh, in the in the survey as well. Employers indicating they're trying to. Uh, focus on that, which makes a lot of sense as they're, as they're uh, trying to address stress. Um, so let me show you a, a couple other results quickly. Um, incentive rewards are always very interesting. You can see here in the U.S. right now, um, if we look at the first segment of the bar, the dark blue shows how many offer incentive rewards today, and the next segment shows how many plan to offer it. In the U.S., we're almost reaching a point where almost every employer um, would have some sort of incentive reward. And, and again, incentive rewards can, you know, mean different things in different parts of the world. Um, but you can see, um, and if you would compare this to recent years, there's actually been a lot of growth, uh, not only in the U.S. but in other parts of the world as well, at uh, adopting them. Although, although there is much lower adoption rates in some parts of the world. What are these incentive rewards focused on? Um, you can see here on this list, and again, this is a global average, but. Doing a, you know, completing a health appraisal or maybe a health screening or at the top, there's a lot of, been a lot of growth in different types of workplace health challenges or competitions, healthy competitions. Um, and you can look on uh, down the list. Um, near the bottom is um, achieving or maintaining health status results. So these are incentives that are tied specifically to some health values such as blood pressure or cholesterol. Um, there's a lot of attention to that, especially in the U.S. There's some uh, top, you know, high-profile employers are, are taking that approach, but 
overall uh, pretty low on the scale, although if you look at the segments of the second and third segments that show the growth rate, you can see that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of employers indicating that they plan to uh, implement that type of incentive. So it will be interesting to see where that goes. Um, so with all of this interest in incentives, another really interesting question that we ask each year is how effective are your incentives at influencing behavioral changes? And um, this, this hasn't changed much for the last few years when we've asked it. We asked it to rate on a scale from one to five, and um, most of the programs get rated as a two or a three, which is not a very, you know, not a very high uh, rating in the, in the scale of things, especially given the amount that some employers are investing in incentives. Um, the average um, among U.S. employers this year was $200 to, uh, $220 per employee invested in incentives. So um, for a large organization, obviously that can add up to a lot of money, and you would think that employers would expect um, or, or would hope for a better result from this. So I think this is um, something we're going to continue to see a lot of focus in. How do we make these uh, incentives more effective? Right. The last thing I'd like to um, talk about briefly is measurement. Um, you can see here that um, almost two-thirds of employers said that they're not measuring outcomes from their health promotion program. Last year we asked the question, are you measuring any financial outcomes? And we had a very low take-up rate, and we thought, well, maybe it's that word financial that people are getting hung up on um, because you might be measuring, you know, health uh, improvements in health status or, you know, participation or, or things that people might not consider to be financial. So we took that word out this year. We still got a pretty low rate, and it's, it's somewhat um, surprising um, that such a small percentage of employers are saying that they're measuring any specific outcome from their health promotion program. So I think, um, again, this is an area that uh, I, I believe really is going to need to increase. I think perhaps it could be tied back in part to one of the first slides I showed that indicated that most of these programs are only a few years old, um, and um, there may be some element of employers um, feeling that, um, you know, they have some initial momentum in releasing the programs. They don't perhaps need to measure them yet, um, but I, I would have to believe that with the amount of dollars that continue to be invested in these programs that if they're going to be able to continue the investment, they're going to need to start showing some sort of uh, results or impact. These are the key reasons for those two-thirds of employers that aren't measuring anything. These are the reasons they give that they're not measuring their programs. Um, insufficient resources, always, you know, a key, key challenge. Um, they don't know how to measure the programs or they don't have priority from leadership. Um, again, the bottom two, I think, are, are somewhat encouraging. Most of these employers are not saying that they don't believe there's a measurable return or they don't believe the cost of measuring it is justified. So, again, I think that points back to what I was saying, that um, I think there's a belief that the programs will work or perhaps are working. Some of them may be kind of uh, coasting for the few, first few years um, with the belief that they are working, but I, I really think we're going to need to see um, a pretty uh, strong movement toward being able to actually demonstrate that the programs are effective uh, in order to in order to have these programs continue. Uh, the last thing I'll mention here is the concept of a culture of health. We ask a question about it. We ask two questions. We ask, um, do you have a, uh, a culture of health today, and do you plan to pursue one for the future? Um, and it's interesting that, you know, culture of health as a, you know, kind of a term has really uh, also grown just in the last few years. It's something that a lot of people identify with. We have uh, write-in responses in our, um, you know, free te text that people can enter. And I can't tell you how many uh, folks use that terminology of culture of health or culture of health and wellness. Um, so it's something that really seems to be catching on globally. Uh, but what we see here is that if we look at just those who rate it as a four or a five out of five, uh, only about one-third say they have a culture of health today in their organization, uh, but 81% say they plan to pursue it for the future. So, again, I think this is an indicator of a very strong trend uh, of employers 
uh, and, and a focus on, you know, understanding that it's a, that it's a cultural issue. It's not just a financial issue. Uh, it's not just a, uh, you know, mechanical issue in terms of offering programs, but there are, there are real uh, cultural implications as well. Um, so that is, uh, that, that is a, uh, what I had prepared to uh, speak about today and be glad to answer questions. I think, Wolf, we want to uh, hold the questions till the end. Is that correct? Yeah, let, let's take uh, – I wanted to do that, but I'm changing my mind. Let, let's take one question now and do the, do the rest afterwards um, because I thought it was pretty interesting and it always comes up. Um, uh, and that came from, from Muna, from, from Mary Kay. Uh, Barry, uh, so can you, can you unmute her? Is that possible? Yep, I can definitely uh, unmute her. Give me one moment. Okay, Muna. Yes. You can. You have been unmuted, so you can actually um, say your question directly to Barry if you'd like. Okay, um, Barry, I was just wondering what methods are being used to measure productivity and presenteeism. Oh, <laughs> excellent question, and, and I'm sure uh, uh, Wolf can chime in too because this is an area of expertise of his as well. Um, there are a handful of uh, kind of standardized. Um, measures out there that are, uh, the majority of them are self-reported, um, so they're, and they're often embedded into a health risk appraisal. Um, there's the, um, I don't know that I can rattle them all off, but there's the work limitations questionnaire developed by Deborah Lerner at Tufts, and there's the, uh, there's one, that, there's a Ron Kessler one from, uh, from Harvard, there's a Stanford presenteeism scale. There are a handful of them that have been academically developed, um, and, and validated, so they, they have, you know, they have pretty good confidence. I, I know that a lot of times the first impression is, well, why would you trust, you know, employees to self-report? Because so basically you're asking them, you know, over the past, and a typical question might be over the past two weeks, um, you know, how many days or how many hours did you feel you were not as productive as you could have been because of health issues? Um, but, and it seems like something that perhaps people would not be honest about, but the, uh, you know, the research and the data uh, shows otherwise. And, and I can tell you from personal experience, having used it for several, uh, several uh, projects with some of my clients I worked on, the numbers can be pretty astounding. Even if you feel that they're perhaps understated, um, you know, presenteeism is a, is a very real issue. Um, and um, self-reporting, while not ideal, is a, is a good way to get a feel for it. Even you know, to be able to get relative values if you have different types of operations or different business units, um, to be able to see if you have some, you know, certain issues in certain parts of your organization that might be differing um, is, uh, you know, can also be very helpful. So that's the, I think that's the primary way that presenteeism is measured. Do you want to add anything, Wolf? No, but I think it's a, it's a good question. I would, I would just add that, a good answer, sorry. Uh, I would just add that uh, I think a growing number of, of employers, companies are, are measuring it also internationally, not just in the U.S. where most of the research is, originates from. There's actually some research in Europe, too, I, I should say, but most of it comes out of, uh, out of the U.S., but there's more employers now measuring it globally, which is kind of interesting. And you're right, as you said, typically it's integrated in a, in a, in a health risk appraisal. Uh, of course, making it easier so you don't have too many surveys to fill out. And uh, but look, there's still, as you say, a lot of discussion about it, about it. And uh, and then some of the clinical professionals in the world are, are very skeptical. And, and you know, I have a good reason to. But uh, that's, I, th I think I think best available kind of instrument that we have in today's working world. You know, and not in terms of having clear objective indicators is very very difficult. But, um, yeah, that was a good, good answer. Thanks, Barry. I'd, I'd like to move on um, because we're nearly at the half hour and then um, we still have a, a really good presentation coming up. I, I know there's one more question at least. I saw, I saw one from Matthew. Uh, we'll, we'll just take it a little bit later. So um, let's move to our second speaker. Um, Dr. Ralph Franke the, is the Corporate Medical Director at Siemens. And uh, just please go ahead, uh, Dr. Franke, and, and start your presentation. Okay, thank you, Wolf. Um, from my side, also welcome to that uh, meeting from Munich here, and uh, good evening from Munich. <laughs> um, I would like to share with you some thoughts about our strategic context and uh, then about our uh, new health management approach. And uh, so maybe, as you know, um, we as Siemens uh, yeah, focused on a global um, health management approach since, um, yeah, two years, 
and uh, I work for Siemens uh, since uh, two years, and uh, I'm also heading the uh, EHNS department here in Siemens, yeah, Environmental Protection, Health Management and Safety. And uh, the first task was uh, to define and uh, develop a global uh, health management and EHNS organization. And the second one was uh, then to define a strategy and a global concept, uh, especially for health management, so, uh, because it was not uh, existing since uh, those days. And, um, yeah, the strategic context is um, coming from our corporate strategy and the mega trends as, um, you know, maybe globalization, urbanization, demographic change, and, and those topics, and our corporate values. And uh, our uh, common mission for the uh, entire EHNS uh, organization is uh, one world, one life. We care, and that means um, um, fulf uh, the fulfilling of our uh, corporate responsibility regarding an uh, external view for the society and environment and uh, an internal view, uh, safe workplace and, and employees' uh, health. And um, here you can see our three main pillars of my organization, so the environmental part, uh, the safety part on the right side, and uh, health management, um, and uh, you can see um, the health promotion unit um, dealing with health programs and services, education, consulting, and those things. Uh, social counseling, this is, a, yeah, I would say, a, a typical German uh, topic, and uh, we will change it into um, mental well-being in the next uh, future, because um, globally nobody knows what uh, social counseling is, but uh, they are dealing with uh, psychosocial services and uh, management support on that. And then we have uh, the medical services uh, in the traditional approach of identification and minimization of occupational risk and, and medical support. Um, yeah, and here you can see the uh, strategic um, um, aspects, uh, so we are influenced by our uh, Siemens uh, strategic framework and we have a defined um, area of uh, strategy of this uh, triangle, uh, use the power of Siemens, and uh, we have concrete um, strategic goals uh, in fact related to health management. Uh, also, we are part of uh, the conduct um, of the business conduct guidelines, uh, and we are also working together with our uh, colleagues from sustainability uh, in that area of social um, uh, dimension. And uh, that we um, defined, uh, influenced by those uh, three dimensions, the corporate health management policy and, and, and our system. Um, here you can see um, an uh, overview about uh, over our uh, entire organization. So we have uh, three meter cluster um, divided in 17 uh, countries and uh, 190 uh, countries and uh, yeah, almost uh, 400,000 uh, employees are working for Siemens and most of them uh, in the EMEA uh, region and especially in Germany we have uh, 130,000 people and uh, our challenges um, are the um, yeah, uh, 21st uh, century uh, working world with all these uh, globalization related issues, um, traveling and um, also um, rationalization, cost cutting programs and all these uh, topics. Also the different uh, cultures and uh, legal requirements we have to face uh, in, in different countries and cultures and uh, therefore this is a, a big challenge for us to define um, the global, the best fitting global uh, strategy and programs uh, on, on health management. Um, and the first step was um, what, uh, to define what is health for us in, in, in Siemens. Um, what, what is the definition? And I think uh, the World uh, Health Organization uh, has a very good um, definition um, focusing uh, not only on, on the physical uh, dimension, but also on the mental and social well-being and uh, the efficiency. And uh, therefore, we decided uh, to uh, go a little bit beyond uh, our uh, traditional occupational health and safety uh, approach 
by combining two approaches like uh, this health promotion and uh, disease uh, prevention um, approach. And uh, on the rest, uh, on the right hand, you can see um, that uh, this is um, focused on, on uh, or uh, aiming on the goal to uh, get healthy and performing people uh, on board here within the Siemens organization. And um, we are also not only focusing on the individuals, but also uh, on the organization. Um, in the previous times, we um, did only uh, some, some um, yeah, actions um, related to uh, physical health, like uh, body mass index or uh, hypertension or, and, and diabetes programs and things like that. But uh, as um, Barry already mentioned, um, stress-related uh, issues are uh, getting more, uh, more important, and um, I think there is a big need to focus on, on the mental health uh, of our people and uh, to improve their uh, resources. And uh, that means um, also to define uh, a, a good social and, and physical working environment. Uh, and we can't exclude um, the um, social environment of our people, the privacy and, and, and uh, the influence of, of uh, the society. So, um, and on the other hand, um, there are, we, now we have a, a strong alignment um, with our uh, human resources department and to define a respective uh, measures to influence, uh, for instance, the leadership culture uh, here in our uh, Siemens organization. Now, the question is now, um, on a global level, uh, how to describe um, the, how to deal with health and, and uh, then to define the global language for, for health management. And uh, as you already know, we have uh, already this uh, OSAS 80001 uh, management system where um, a big portion of our legal required uh, occupational health um, content is defined and described, but there is uh, no description um, of the voluntary uh, health promotion part. And um, therefore, we decided to uh, develop our own management system, uh, system um, on a, yeah, fitting to the already existing management systems, uh, uh, environmental, ISO, uh, 14001 and this uh, OSAS 18001 to describe in a, in a very good and well-known uh, language for our uh, management uh, how to deal with health on a, on a global uh, level. So, and um, here we are, uh, the management system approach is um, well-known, as I already mentioned, within Siemens and ensures the strategy alignment and builds on management responsibility and describes um, for our uh, health management experts uh, their role and responsibilities. And uh, this is, um, as I already mentioned, 100% uh, compatible with our uh, existing uh, management systems. And um, here you can see that our role is um, to define the policy and, and principles and guidelines and the health management strategy but also to make uh, clear um, what about the roles and responsibilities of the management. So they have to analyze health, they have to uh, define the strategy and the goals, uh, and they have to uh, set up the measures and projects, and they have to control it. And as you can see here the, the uh, famous PCA circle. And also um, part of the health management system is um, to um, describe the health management organization and, and the infrastructure. Um, and on the other hand, then to, to come to uh, respective uh, results. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we also did is not to define uh, in, um, yeah, a special um, health program um, with the this respective measures uh, or concrete measures um, because of uh, the different cultures and business needs around the world, 
Um, so we decided to define a global uh, framework, and uh, this is mandatory. Uh, so and we adapted this on the uh, value chain. So so to say, analyze health, uh, recognize health, experience health, and live health in a sustainable way, and um, covering the uh, five dimensions, physical activity, health of institution, mental well-being, as well as a healthy work environment and medical care and assistance, focused on the target, target groups, uh, employees and managers, as well as the organizational units. And this framework is mandatory uh, for the entire organization and, uh, and now it's up to the uh, respective um, managers in, in, in every unit and in every country then to define the exactly um, local measures um, in this according to this framework. And um, yeah, for the first step was uh, to, because it, it's, uh, for, it's very new, this global approach for Siemens to get an idea um, about the current status. And then we uh, conducted a survey in our uh, organization to, um, yeah, see what, what, um, how many people we have on board, what kind of measures uh, they do, and you um, can see that the uh, level of maturity on health promotion and health management is uh, very good in Germany and in India, uh, surprise, surprise, and um, yeah, in, in Scandinavian countries. And uh, there's a lot to do in, in countries like um, yeah, Taiwan, Philippines, Thailand, and Algeria. And um, to get a, also a, a kind of um, benchmark, um, we conducted uh, a survey together with uh, SOS International in uh, 79 countries. Um, and these countries uh, were chosen by the relevance for Siemens, and uh, there we um, yeah, asked some some questions around um, yeah what what is uh, the benchmark of um, uh, first in class companies and programs uh, around um, health management, also uh, the identification of occupational health provisions that are considered the norm and uh, expected by the majority of employees to get a kind of input um, to discussion on how to calibrate um, health services around, across international best practice and, and uh, local industry standards meeting regulatory requirements as well as identifying opportunities for the first in class health activities and um, then to identify um, health promotion and wellness programs that are considered the norm and expected by the majority of employees to have an input uh, to discussions on how the best to have a health promotion portfolio and as well as um, getting an idea about uh, what is considered as um, the industry standard and uh, also the um, legal uh, required a standard of uh, occupational health and safety, including health management. And you can see here an overview um, about the top five most regulated countries, and um, also on the bottom uh, five least uh, regulated countries. And in some countries, not all regulations are implemented as an industry standard, for, for instance, in, in Moldova. And uh, some countries have a large difference between regulatory requirements and industry standards for multinationals. And this may depend on the type of multinationals operating uh, in, the, in the country, particularly in, in high-risk countries, so for instance in, in, in Malaysia. Um, yeah, and, and here um, you can see an overview. Um, of uh, the regula uh, like regulatory requirements and industry standards um, in, yeah, in, in our clusters. Uh, here we have our 17 clusters, Middle East, uh, USA, Canada, and so on. And um, the industry standards in general are higher than the regulatory requirements. And um, we found also that many clusters have a wide range, for instance, regulatory requirements for countries in, in the Asian cluster 
uh, range from 21 to 75 uh, percent and um, conclusions um, for single countries have to be done on the basis of uh, single country reports and um, yeah, we did it in a, in a second step. And um, here on a, in, a, in a deeper dive, um, we had uh, six broad areas covered by this uh, research project. So we have uh, contractors, health promotion, return to work, medical services, and uh, risk assessment and health screening. And in, in the risk assessment and health screening um, activities, um, they remain at the core uh, of the minimal regulatory requirement in almost all of the reviewed countries. 100% of uh, the countries have regulations in this area with an equally high presence of industry standards and practices. And uh, periodical health screening and pre-employment activities are uh, subject to regulatory requirements in 100% and uh, 75% of uh, percent of countries respectively. Pre-travel pre and uh, pre-assignment health screens offer the opportunity for us to be um, first in class. So we decided uh, to set up in our EHNS program a, tra a Siemens Traveler Health um, Check program on a global level. So that means um, we, we uh, offer checkups for our business travelers in total. Um, yeah, and if you see here the, the uh, health promotion uh, column, the number of countries uh, with health promotion regulations um, uh, is significantly less than for the other uh, OH areas. In total, 42 of countries had one or more regulations uh, related to the broad health promotion area, although um, it is not regulated in a very large number of countries. It is an industry standard practice for companies to run programs um, in 73 um, of these countries. And um, this health promotion um, area we divided in uh, um, yeah, stress and psychosocial activities, promotion and wellness and, and vaccination um, programs. And there we found that um, the a very few companies um, with any had any programs at all in, in, in stress and psychosocial activities. So um, therefore, we, we decided um, that could be a good um, chance to be considered as first in class to uh, set up a program, especially on stress and, and psychosocial uh, activities. Good. So far, um, from my side, um, yeah, I'm open to hear uh, to get some some questions from you. Great, great. Thanks so much. That was uh, very interesting. I enjoyed that. Um, okay, so uh, for questions, uh, basically, you can uh, type in your question, or if you prefer to, to, I know we can't unmute everybody, but to. to Raise it verbally. You can just uh, put a cue in the in the in the console, so we we, we get that notice um, that you want to ask a question. So I don't see any additional ones. I still have Matthew's question at this point, and this was uh, for Barry. So why don't we take that one now? And um, let me just read it for now. It's uh, Barry. Can you say a word or two about penalties versus incentives? Sure, that's sort of the carrot versus the stick approach, um, and uh, we did we did look at that in the in the survey. Um, we started making that distinction a couple of years ago as we started to see more employers talking about penalties. Um, but I can tell you that it's still very very low um, the usage of penalties versus uh, rewards uh, in in terms of health promotion incentives. And some of them are, there's really kind of a gray line. I mean, one of the most popular things that employers would identify as a penalty would be uh, primarily in the U.S. Uh, an increase in health insurance premiums for those employees who choose, you know, not to participate in a program or a health screening. And, you know, on the flip side, you could give a discount for those employees who do participate. So 
in reality, it's it's uh, it's a premium differential for those who participate versus don't, and how you describe it or communicate it is really what makes it a perceived as a penalty or a uh, a reward. Um, but I, I don't want to underestimate the the importance of how it is communicated because I think that can kind of set the tone for the program as well. I suspect that uh, many employers shy away from using penalties because uh, they don't, uh, you know, they want to have a more positive uh, tone to their to their programs overall, and they feel that um, uh, you know communicating uh, in the manner of a, of a penalty might uh, might kind of backfire with the program. Now, having said that, there are, are other employers who are perhaps reaching a point of um, you know greater frustration that they're that they are not getting the participation levels they would like to get from their program. So maybe they're turning the screws a little bit more and saying let's let's make this this feel a little bit more mandatory. The reality is in most uh, parts of the world the programs are voluntary. So if you want to get participation, you've got to use something you know in the line of an in, in incentive. Um, so it'll be interesting to see um, see where that goes in terms of uh, uh, whether more employers are going to adopt uh, penalties or not. But for right now, not we don't see many. Great. Th thanks, Barry. I have uh, I see two more uh, interesting questions here. I think these are for 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 Alp. Uh, I can uh, unmute them, Wolf. It might be better interaction if we unmute them. Okay, sure. Which, yep. Just some sense of timer. Go ahead. How about we go with Charles first? He, he raised it first. Charles Elliot. Charles Elliot. Uh, uh, it's like uh, I can't identify him actually on on the, the audio. Okay. Why don't I just read that one then? Then maybe after we take Susan's. Um, the question is, I'm not sure if you can see it. Uh, Ralph, but it's, uh, how do you get separate industry standards for occupational health requirements of workers around the world? I cannot find a source. One how do you get separate industry standards for occupational health requirements of workers around the world? Um, yeah, so this is a, this is a local uh, topic. So we delegated the, the responsibility for compliance to, uh, on, on, on uh, legal requirements uh, on, a, on a local level. So every country CEO is responsible for the uh, fulfillment uh, of, of uh, legal requirements, and uh, we are describing the, uh, the management system, and this is part of the management system. Uh, so this is not up to me to have an overview of all the uh, international uh, or the legal requirements of, of every country. So that, that's a mess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. So okay, we, good. We are we are we are uh, auditing uh, the management systems, and this is uh, a part of uh, the audit to to look after the uh, compliance and and have uh, yeah effective control mechanisms uh, in place. Okay, good. Um, Barry, do you want to unmute Susan? Yep, I can do that. Susan, come on, Barry. Go ahead, Susan. Ask your question. Hi, thank you. Um, you had talked about the, the di difference between the corporate and the organizational unit responsibilities. Um, so it, it sounds as though you have rolled out the organizational unit's expectations around health promotion, but my question is, is there then an expectation that countries report their health promotion activities or achievements back to a corporate level? And, and if so, what's your process for that? Mm -hmm. yeah, this is part of our health management system. We uh, want to run out, uh, roll out uh, in the next two or three years because it will last, uh, I think, two or three years um, at least. And uh, the expectation is on the first step uh, to report uh, only the um, yeah, amount of, of uh, measures and, and not really uh, the, the outcome because um, it's, it's a, um, yeah, a big issue to have global um, KPIs on, on to measure the uh, respective outcome of uh, health promotion activities. Uh, so on the first step is, um, this is the other part, uh, to answer the question how healthy is Siemens, uh, we developed um, with our global engagement survey 
um, as part of our global um, engagement survey, which is um, annually conducted, um, a kind of health index. So we ask one uh, special health-related question, and then we uh, added um, five um, other questions, uh, which gave us a kind of information of um, health in our uh, understanding. And there we uh, are calculating a so-called health index out of uh, those um, questions. And um, we, we don't have any global um, KPI at the moment. Okay, I guess uh, that answers your question, Susan. I think we may have time. Uh, um, okay, Barry, what, what question do we have? Uh, I think there's one more. We have okay. one more. Yeah, sure. Um, well, we've got two more lined up, one from Ruth and one from, if you take the one from Paul Ashcroft as well. So, Ruth, uh, go ahead and ask a question. Hi, Daniel. It's Ruth uh, from Zee Life. Um, question for Ralph. Um, just really wanted to understand uh, where you see the main gaps uh, are for you and the challenges that you've faced uh, with your global strategy. Yeah, first of all, the, uh, <laughs> the awareness uh, for um, health promotion at all. Yeah? So um, we are facing um, a lot of, uh, yeah, let's say ignorance uh, about those um, topics because um, our management, um, in, especially in, in lower developed countries, is not really interested in, in, in uh, investing in, in the health of the people. So especially in countries in Africa or India or China. And uh, there is a lot of work to do uh, to have another uh, or to implement a, an, another culture, yeah, another leadership culture, another um, yeah, self-understanding of how to deal with our people on a global level. And, so, and uh, therefore, we started um, our EHNS program and uh, one really big um, uh, lever is uh, that we are now a part of our uh, executive development programs. Uh, so to um, um, teach our management uh, uh, what is our expectation on, on healthy leadership. And on the other hand, we have now a zero harm culture project running from the top management down to uh, every side um, dealing with the safety culture and this goes in, in the same direction uh, and, and uh, my hope is uh, that we will have um, on a global level um, another health and safety culture uh, within the entire Siemens organization but at the moment uh, we face a lot of issues uh, in the acceptance and awareness uh, especially in, in, in lower developed countries. Excellent. Yeah, I think that's a, a common challenge for many multinational employers, no doubt. Let's take one more. I think we're very close here. But uh, uh, Paul's question was, have you considered providers or vendors as part of a global strategy? And do you have any cross-border providers? Yes. Uh, currently, we are looking for those providers because we are uh, now in the phase of a global rollout and uh, we need some uh, <laughs> uh, good partners on that. Great. That's good. Very good. Okay. Um, Barry, any, I guess we have three more minutes. Or should I close it? Or do you have any more questions lined up? We've got a few questions uh, that have been specifically uh, to the host, so I don't eat me. Um, we've got one to Dr. Frank, who uh, says from Don Fisher, uh, can you give examples of measures of organizational health and how that, measures uh, how that measure differs by country? How? Once again, I, I can't get you. It says, um, can you give examples of measures of organizational health and how that measure differs by country? Organizational health? Yes. Okay. Um, this, is, uh, this is our... Um, um, yeah, 
this employee engagement survey. Uh, there we uh, measure the engagement uh, of our uh, people every year, and that gives us also um, an, uh, yeah, an idea about uh, the health of our organization. And there we can exactly describe our um, describe the the um, health status um, of of respective organizational units. And on the other hand, uh, we have uh, or where we have medical services that we get uh, internal data um, uh, of uh, the the um, health of our people, so um, medical data like blood pressure, back pain, and, and complaints, and, and all these things, and uh, there we can, um, yeah, define, uh, tell the respective management uh, what what um, issues they have in their respective organizational unit related to uh, the physical health status and, and the uh, mental health status. But this is not on a global scale, so the um, um, only um, tool on a global uh, scale we have is this uh, engagement survey. Great. Well, thanks so much for taking all these questions to, to both of you and, and for presenting, first of all, to, to Barry and, and Ralph. I think we're at the end. Um, of course, I would like to thank everybody for joining. Uh, I know we had a couple of uh, issues or problems for some people to dial in. I apologize for that. I'm not sure what the reason is at this point, but um, we will have the uh, recording so of this session, you know, including the, the slides, available in about a week or so. So that, that will come with a follow-up email and the link. So if you missed the first, you know, quarter or third of the session or something like that, we will, uh, you can, uh, you know, log back in and get it. Uh, so that would be, yes, I hope that will work out for you. And as always, please provide us with your feedback, uh, also for future sessions, topics, regions, that's always uh, very, very useful. And as I indicated earlier, our next webinar will be May. We'll uh, uh, finalize a date pretty soon. And we'll take a special look also at uh, our corporate social responsibility links to health and well-being. So that's, uh, that's in, our, uh, in our plans. And I hope you can join us again. And I wish you... Uh, a nice sunny spring or, or maybe in fall if you're in the southern hemisphere. So all the best and uh, have a good rest of your week. Thanks a lot again. Goodbye.